<laughs> so thank you very much for your presence uh, today and thanks also to our followers following us on social media and Facebook. Please feel free to interact and ask your questions. I will be happy to relay them to uh, our speaker, uh, Madame Menkiran. Um, and so now I will leave the, the floor to our ambassador, Monsieur François Xavier Léger. Good evening. Uh, I will start from rugby and not <laughs> what to this topic. Why? Because rugby and food have three things in common. The first one is France. French being the, uh, the best nation for rugby and food. <laughs> As an ambassador, I'm, I'm pretty convinced of it. <laughs> the second point is rugby men usually is a lot of food. And then it's a with what they call the third half after the game, the join and the drink and the enjoy food. And the third one is more related to today's topic in, in food and in rugby. Uh, people they agree on some rules. There's a rule of the game, the rugby field. And uh, all people agree that the, there is a referee and the referee should be respected. And uh, everybody enjoying the game uh, hopes also that uh, the players are not taking any uh, prohibited substances <laughs> to improve their performance. And I would say that uh, this is why it's related to today's topic and uh, uh, what we are, we have in our plate and how we should analyze it and on which common standards we should agree on to make sure that what we have in our plate is really what we think is in our plate. So, and uh, I came from the Rugby World Cup and I arrived to uh, today's topic uh, due to that uh, thought I had. So today is uh, the second uh, conference that we are doing in the field of health science and uh, we call it Eureka Chat and the idea is to bring some let's say, scientific and technological uh, knowledge to uh, all interested people and not only to people having that uh, let's say expertise or specialty. So today and I will give the floor to our guests so we are welcoming uh, Mrs. Tita Benkiran, and she's a specialist uh, in that uh, field of uh, food safety and food standards. And, and I'm sure we will learn a lot from her. And uh, I wish all of you a uh, very good evening. And uh, you can share questions, not only here uh, physically with us, but also online, because uh, we are also uh, some uh, audience online today. So thank you so much and this is Ben Kiran. I give you the mic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your welcome. So before uh, I will present myself, but before presenting myself, it would be nice to know to whom I'm speaking because the topic is very, very, very large, so very wide. And uh, it would be interesting for me to know what are your specific uh, interests when you are here. <laughs> so please, uh, Victoria. Victoria, Victoria <laughs> sorry. I was not far. Yep. So, I'm a nutritionist. I am very interested in uh, food safety and hygiene. Um, I will have some questions later on, but yeah, I'm very interested in hearing what you have to say. And, uh, I'll ask you my questions at the end. Okay. <laughs> um, I've been in Fiji for 10 years. I guess tonight I represent my husband, who is known as Chef Philip from Holiday Inn. So we are very much interested in uh, food safety and food in general. And um, Philip apologized because he just resumed work yesterday after a four week holiday, so he couldn't have time. And even. So thanks in advance for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that we will do a replay so you can watch the conference afterwards. So hello, my name is Quentin. Uh, I've been in Fiji for almost two years now. Um, I'm an engineer in water treatment. And I'm here most, mostly out of curiosity based on what was advised. So I'm very, very curious. 
Hello everyone, uh, Jessica from Consumer Council. I'm here with my Rosie Pinash. Um, basically, uh, at the council, the Consumer Council, we receive uh, complaints relating to food and safety issues. So it'd be interesting to um, uh, hear from you in terms of how we can uh, improve perhaps our knowledge uh, surrounding the community. Uh, as Jessica said, uh, I'm the manager of Genpens Information and Media at the Consumer Council of Fiji. I'm also the project manager for the Consumer Council. Uh, so as Jessica has mentioned, so when it comes to uh, food safety, the Consumer Council of Fiji, uh, as the custodians of consumer rights in Fiji, we oversee that. Uh, we, uh, we, try, we always try to ensure that food safety is maintained. Uh, on the other hand, we also look at issues pertaining to food security uh, and sustainability as well. Uh, we get a, a lot of donor funding, especially from Consumers International, that's the International Membership Organization for Consumer Bodies, uh, to conduct special projects uh, pertaining to food security. Yeah. Thank you. I will come and have a meeting with you because I will uh, tell you about my project, what I'm doing here, because I need to meet the Consumers Association, right? probably here. Okay, and we have just been hosting in Fiji three weeks ago, and like a lot of people, I'm interested in like, what's in my place, especially here in Fiji. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hee, uh, Hee is living in Fiji, and also very interested in about this subject. Thank you. Concerning healthy eating, and definitely when it comes to my food of play, definitely will be interested to know about it. Thank you. And the uh, Ricardo is my colleague and my bestie. <laughs> Sorry, I think I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Moon. I'm a medical scientist by profession, and I work uh, for WHO, but uh, I'm a technical assistant to Minister of Health and the Family Health Unit. Thank you. Thank you very much. We also have uh, Abel online. Uh, he's part of the Social Innovators Group of the French Embassy, and he's watching us from Australia. Thanks. Uh, so the stress is getting high because there are a lot of specialists here, and welcome. I'm very happy that you're here. So my name is Rita Ventura. It's written G-H-I-T-A, but it's pronounced Rita. It's more of a name. I have a quite international uh, career path. But I started by being an engineer in agriculture in France, and from there I moved to the UK. I did a food marketing and product management master's degree, and started to work in the UK in 91, last century. <laughs> well, at the period of the Malco disease. So it was the very beginning of the Food Safety Act, and any topics linked to food safety. And from there, I moved to Mauritius. I lived in Mauritius five years. I worked a lot in food safety as well, anything related to quality management system. And then I've widened my scope. Since then, I've been working quite um, around the world, a lot in Africa, uh, Southeast Asia. And today, I'm, in, I'm based in Suva since mid-July, so it's nearly three months, at, um, at the forum, Secretariat at PIF, so I'm working there. It's a UNIDO project, so I'm a UNIDO quality infrastructure expert, and the project is about implementing and developing the quality infrastructure in the region, and this is why I will come and meet you, because I need to meet uh, people from public organizations as well as consumers associations. And today I will try to, um, to really share with you a very, very wide topic because I've been working in that sector for more than 30 years. Uh, there's a lot to do. It was very challenging for me to find the right balance between um, everyday dialogue, everyday vocabulary, but still bringing some scientific uh, knowledge to you. As you know, in French, we say bon appétit when you eat. But uh, when you're working in food safety, you don't say bon appétit anymore, you say bon courage, good luck. <laughs> and in Arabic, and Muslim people say bismillah, 
which is for the, the heart. And um, we used in the past to pray before eating, which is a good thing because you're honoring the food. The food is, why do we eat? We eat to have, of course, pleasure of eating. It's a social event for some people, not for all. Sometimes it's just eating because we need to. But it's, um, it's a way to get energy. I mean, the food is the way we get our energy, so it's very important to know what we're eating. As I said to Laurence, if I was applying what I know about food, I wouldn't eat anymore. I, so I wanted to start with a question for you. What is food quality for you? What are you expecting from food quality? When we are talking about food quality, what does it mean for you? We are all specialists in food safety because we all eat around three times a day. So you're all specialists in food safety. So what do you expect when you speak about food quality? So from outside, they usually promote organic uh, home 
So what we want as well is uh, to make sure that it stays tasty, it's safe, and we'll see that there are many different kinds of, uh, of hazards in foods, and chemical is part of one hazard that has to be considered. Okay, thank you. If there is any comment on, on live, Laurence will hesitate. Okay, but, and if you have any question, I'm happy to answer your question. And water is part of the risk as well. Come in, come in. It's, it's the surprise behind the screen. <laughs> you know, it's just like a theater. Buddha. So what we look for food, when we talk about food quality, uh, what you said that nutrients, vitamins, the taste. So this is what we call the organoleptic quality of the food, how it tastes. And my first job was to work in a, in a food um, sensory evaluation laboratory at Nestle. So we were tasting food and giving some profile to the food um, using the five senses. So how you look, the look of the food, the taste, the, the, uh, the touch of the touch in the mouth as well. And uh, it's very important because uh, we use those, those sensory analysis profile to give some technical specification to the food industries. For example, we know that olive oil, uh, the more you go to the north of Europe, the people want it less green, and the slowest you go down, they want, they want to have a real green olive oil. So in Morocco, for example, the olive oil is much greener than in the UK, for example. So we are adapting the food taste to the uh, target market as well. And I will speak about uh, the way we do newer marketing at the end of that conference. Energy, so uh, food is bringing um, kilocalories, so this brings you energy. And some people that are doing diets, they use the kilocal for, to calculate their uh, daily uh, in, in, input. But, uh, no, I said Victoria. Yes. Good. <laughs> Victoria will give you more information than I will, because she's a nutritionist, which is not my part. But what is important as well, it's not only about energy and uh, nutrients, but as well acid and basic foods. We know that uh, acidic food is not good for the health, and it can even bring some cancer. So we can get cancers from eating. And um, when you have a food safe food uh, poisoning outbreak, it's very quick, and I'll show you some uh, deadlines and delays in terms of uh, getting sick. But the problem with chemical like uh, pesticide and uh, phytosanitary products is that it's a long-term effect and this is really uh, the problem today with uh, processed food. And you, you would expect to have vitamins, which is very important because the way we would process the food, we would try to keep the most vitamins in the food. For example, when you buy um, milk, if you take uh, sterilized meal, milk, you'll have less vitamins than UHT, which is ultra high temperature. I mean, the way the, the food is processed, you can lose a lot, you're losing a lot of the nutrients and vitamins from the food, so the best way is to have fresh food, but sometimes we cannot, or before working in a restaurant or a big uh, catering industry, you need to have uh, processed food. So why do we preserve food? I've started to tell you that as soon as the vegetable is uh, harvested or the animal is slaughtered, it starts to die. Surprise, surprise. Hello. <laughs> so as soon as we uh, harvest, vegetable or slaughter, we need to preserve 
the, the, the food so that it's safe when you're eating it. And the, the, what's happening with the globalization and the export of food is that the point of harvesting or slaughtering and the time of consumption has become more and more important. In the past centuries, we were eating food that were very proximate to our houses, eating food from the farm, from around the village, which is still the case in some traditional places, but still they're using chemicals today. Uh, so real organic food is very difficult to have. But what's happening is that the, between the point of production and the point of consumption, it, become, it became longer and longer. So you need to preserve food. So how do you think they were present, preserving food in a traditional way? Do you have any idea of the way we were preserving food in the past? Salt, salt, drying, smoking, yeah, honey, honey as well. So it's uh, preserved by uh, sugar. Sugar is a way of preserving food as well. So what we were doing? I mean, the bacteria needs bacteria is like that, huh? That's my bacteria. That's my friend. Bacteria needs uh, five things to develop. Heat. Heat. It's at the right temperature. Humidity. Water. What does it need the bacteria to develop? Proteins. Food. Two more. Time. Time. Very important. Because the development is exponential. And the right pH. Acidity. Okay? So the normal, the most common bacteria would develop in a normal conditions. But some bacteria don't like water, for example. Oh, sorry, I forgot the sixth one. Oxygen. Because some, some bacteria, they don't like oxygen. They are called anaerobic. And so we remove the oxygen as well in some, most of the food to preserve the food. So the way we preserve, for example, if you dry the food, that means you remove one factor. You remove the water, OK? If you put um, salt or sugar, you remove the um, water availability in the cell as well. If you uh, smoke it, it's a way of drying as well. And uh, um, not, you have less availability of proteins. And this is why when we ask for cleaning, it's very important because any dirt has proteins. So dirt is a way of feeding the bacteria. And this is why cleaning and disinfection is very important. So any way of preserving food would follow those kind of, we would, we would consider those parameters, but we have to consider which bacteria we're talking of, because we won't have the same bacteria into milk or um, meat products or fish. And we're, here we're only talking about bacteria. You've got yeast and molds as well. But then you've got viruses. And I'm just talking about the uh, bacteriological hazard. I'm not talking about physical or chemical contamination here. I don't want to do a food safety course. Huh? I really want to give you some elements so that it's easy for you to, to buy your food. But if you want a professional food safety course, it's really different. This one is. So here I forgot one parameter, which was uh, ox no, oxygen, water. I forgot the water here. So every time you want to preserve the food, you have to co you have to consider those six parameters. So what kind of food outbreaks we have? So here you have the list. I'm happy to share that presentation with you if you want. Um, if we take, uh, for example, 
Um, Listeria. Listeria is the main bacteria that is present in dairy products. Okay. Um, we don't have Salmonella here, but 90%, 80% of the chicken that you are buying got Salmonella. So it's very important to cook them very well. And we'll see the temperature control for that. Uh, when you're uh, having uh, vegetables and salads, you've got Clostridium, the branches here. So you have to clean very well because uh, Clostridium will be present into the soil. And this is why cleaning is very important. E. coli, Escherichia coli, is all anything undercooked. And this is why, for example, raw meat is um, very often forbidden in some places. For example, in the plain, you would never have um, sliced meat. It's taste. And just for your information, the pilot and the co-pilot never eat the same thing because if they have a food poisoning outbreak, it's a problem. So they never eat the same thing. Uh, what else? You've got uh, the botulism. Botulism is very important. It's, uh, it comes a lot from canned foods. And it's very important that you never store an open can in the fridge. Because if you keep the, can, the food in the open can, there will be some exchange of oxygen because canning means removing oxygen so that the bacteria cannot develop. So if you leave the food in the can, I don't know, did you know about that? No. Most people don't know, it's very important to know that because botulism can bring, uh, can create paralysis. So it's a very dangerous illness and yes, you can die from it. Um, and at, on the right side, I put the symptoms. So you've got uh, different delays. And when you go to see the doctor to, if you go to see the doctor, most of the time we don't, but if ever you go to see the doctor, we, and especially when there are more than three persons having the same food poisoning outbreak, it becomes uh, a public food poisoning outbreak, which should be um, reported to the Ministry of Health. I don't know how many people at uh, how many people uh, or how many food outbreaks you have in Fiji? Is this a, a big problem? Yeah. Do you have statistics about the food poisoning outbreaks? Not really. And it's very important to have the statistics so that we know where the problem comes from. Maybe the consumer association would be would have more statistics. Uh, so food poisoning, we do receive complaints by the consumer spirit that there's a food poisoning. But the, the challenge which we face in Fiji is for us, uh, no doctor will write because they don't have testing facilities that we are suffering from food poisoning. So there's no way we'll be able to provide the test in that case. Uh, and <coughs> Even if you want to test it, uh, two years ago, uh, so we like to test the uh, milk, liquid milk. So the result which we got, ultimately, it was after four months. So because of the time frame as well, uh, so that is why food testing, especially for uh, food poisoning, it really happens in Fiji uh, because of the challenges, facil uh, facilities, expertise, the length of time it takes, as well as the cost which is and this is part of the project we are implementing now with the forum. It's really to uh, have more labs in the region. Yeah. It's very important so that you can you know where the problems come from. Now, uh, when you go to the doctor and you've got uh, and you declare a food poisoning, he would play the role of a detective to know what you ate when, because then we go backward to see from how many times you've been ill, and depending if it's a diarrhea or vomiting or, and, or headaches, it won't be the same bacteria. So I used to know by heart all the symptoms, not anymore. Um, but uh, you see, for example, hysteria takes one to four weeks. It's a long, you cannot know what is, you were talking about traceability. It's very difficult to know exactly where it comes from. But if you had bad eggs, 
you can you can feel you know sometimes if you know well your body you can see where which food was to be um, accused of that food poisoning outbreak. I don't know if you had any food poisoning outbreak. Was it easy for you to know from which food it was coming from? I did. I did have. I've already had two, but not that bad, huh? But I know exactly from which food it comes. Because I, you know, you, when you know your body, you know your reaction, you can really feel which food was uh, to be accused. Yes. Yes, Victoria? Yeah, no, I had something left over, so I didn't store properly, and I was sick, very sick, and after that, and I'm just not sure. And you know where it comes from. And now I know when it's old, I just throw it away. <laughs> but most of the food poisoning appears at home because the people don't know how to store food. And the most important factor is temperature of storing, storing temperature, which is here. It's a bit, uh, I will read it for you, it's a bit uh, small. But what is really important is to consider what we call the danger zone. It's 5 to 63 degrees. Why do we call it the danger zone? Because it's the zone where you've got most of the bacteria development. And um, one question. At which temperature is your body? 37. Did you ever wonder why? Why 37 and not 35 or 40? <coughs> It's a safe temperature. Safe for whom? And why? Yeah, yeah, it's a, keep on, keep on, you're on the right path. Because we've got more bacteria in our body than cells yes. that help us to digest and to live, and it's the perfect temperature for bacterial development. So now you know why it's 37. And why we call it the danger zone? Because it's really the, the best. Um, um, this is. The quantity of bacteria. So the, the development of the bacteria is exponential. And the best temperature for them to develop is between 5 to 63 degree, and this is why we call it the danger zone. So if you want, for example, you have to reheat food, it's very important to go above 63. If you're cooking poultry, it's important that the herd of the chicken is above 63. And this is why when you are cooking frozen foods, you can have food poisoning outbreak if you don't wait for the whole product to be defrosted. Because then the heating temperature won't uh, reach 63 and above at the heart of the chicken. So it's very important to take the time to defreeze and then to cook. <coughs> and not to cook directly frozen foods. Now the other thing to know is that um, heat doesn't, heat kills bacteria but not the cold. Cold makes them sleep. It's what we call hibernation. They're sleeping, and once they are defrosted, for example, you're cooking some food at home, and then you freeze them, you won't eat anymore. Please, I don't apply what I know. I'm, I told you, otherwise I wouldn't eat. But there are some basic rules to know. So when you're freezing food at home, you can. It's not uh, industrial food freezing, but we do it, we all do it. But what is important is that when you defreeze your, your food, so the development will grow, and then, for example, it will stop here. And if you refreeze the, the, the same food, it will start from here. So next time, it will grow up to there. And this is why it's written on the facts, I don't know if you noticed that, on frozen foods, do not refreeze after defrosting. Because of that, because cold does not kill the bacteria. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say about um, 
cold. So that's for cold. Now heat is killing bacteria, but not all bacteria. Most of the bacteria are killed above 63 degrees. Pasteurization temperature is 72. So when you want to pasteurize um, jams or milk. And then you've got uh, boiling at 100 degrees. And you've got sterilization at 121, which is not on that graph here. Because <coughs> some bacteria is putting themselves like in spores. They are in hibernation stage. And once they come back to the danger zone, which is not the danger zone for them, it's the best zone, for, it's the best way for them to develop, then they will grow again. So for some temperature, when you do a sterilized food, you need to process them above 121 degree. Okay. Now another, um, I'm going to share some tips with you. How do you know, for example, because when you've got frozen food, you, you need to be sure that the um, cold chain is not broken. And this is why I prefer to buy fresh food, because I'm sure the cold chain is not broken. But how do you know when you go to the supermarket that the cold chain was broken? For example, you've got a pack of peas. Yeah, there's a huge block instead of Exactly. Peas. Because when it's defrost, the water is coming, and when it's refreeze, it makes ice and it makes a block. So when you buy shrimps or peas or whatever, you need to touch the pack. And if it's a block, that means there was, uh, the cold chain was broken. OK? It's very important to know that. Because I don't know here, but I know that in some supermarkets, they cut the electricity in the night because it's too expensive. Is it the case here? Yes. yes. <laughs> electricity is expensive. Um, when you do we go around Fiji, you will notice that there is no um, awareness about how you need to store the food or not much awareness about like validity days. That's the downturn. Expiry dates. Expiry dates. That's before People do not seem to be very much concerned with this. No, because they were not taught of that and this is why we do that conference. And, um, but it's, it's why awareness is really important. I did a project in Tanzania, which was really interesting, and I invite you to do the same. I did a project with the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, and I used the Tanzanian drawer to show that we can prepare food in a traditional way, but still ensuring safety of food. And it was uh, taught at school, instead of teaching stupid things Today, <laughs> we should teach them how to <coughs> consider safe food because people, they don't know. Even the way where you put things in the fridge. They use the fridge as a cupboard, but it's not. And this is why most of the food poisoning outbreak are coming at home because people, they, they don't check the temperature of their fridge or they store too much food in the fridge, especially after shopping, so that the temperature cannot be cold in the right temperature. And the fridge should be above five degrees. Now the other thing is when you go for a buffet. Below five. Uh, sorry, below. Thanks. Not above. <laughs> below. Thanks. When you go in the buffet, uh, they, they are preparing food in advance. So my advice, or what I'm doing, is not to consume anything which could have been stored to, because if it's stored outside in the danger zone more than two hours, it can become contaminated. So I try to avoid mayonnaise or anything with dairy products, so unless I know the place. For example, I'd be very happy to eat uh, at your place because I know there's some awareness, but in some places, um, when I travel, I do buy food and meat, which is just uh, put outside. I will make sure that it's cooked, well cooked, never take raw meat. I used to eat raw meat when I was a kid, but not anymore. And uh, always make sure that it's very well cooked. And when you reheat your uh, leftovers at home, make sure it's really above 63 degrees. Um, any other question? Yeah. Uh, I had a, a 
question about uh, botulism. Uh, you were saying that uh, you're not supposed to store uh, canned food once it's open. So what are you supposed to do with leftovers from canned food? Are you supposed to eat the whole can? No, you can transfer it to a, a, a food uh, container. Okay, just leave that with the can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's the metal that would have an exchange of oxygen with the food and can contaminate the food. <coughs> Don't leave any uh, metal can open. Going back to this, um, I mean, nowadays, a lot of the cans have got a, a special white covering in it, so it's not metal, it's a white plastic. Uh, is that enough to protect us from any case of what it is? No? That's, that's a tricky question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you don't know what I'm referring to. Yeah. Um, these cans with, which have a white yes. lining in, inside. Could be inside this. Ah, inside? Yeah. No, no, it's, uh, this is... Well, this would avoid the contamination of taste. It's not like a metal, but still, it's still metal. It's still uh, sterilized cans. They need to be in metal because they're getting into a, a process which is uh, heated above 121 degrees, and it has to be uh, metal. Okay, it's a kind of aluminum. Mm. And the other question, you were clear about a never heat um, <coughs> Food from frozen, but I mean, if you heat frozen food long enough, you're in the safe zone. It's just a question of how long you do it. If you throw it in a soup and you boil it for 20 minutes, then you're fine, aren't you? Yeah, but you have really to taste, to test with a knife that it's really uh, the, in, the inside, especially for ducks or poultry or meat. You really have to make sure that the herd temperature is above 63 degrees. Because if it's still frozen, it's not the case with fish because they defrost very quickly, or, or shrimps. But with a big turkey at Christmas time, there are a lot of food poisoning outbreak because of that. Because we're cooking, we're not waiting that the turkey to be completely defrosted before cooking. Thank you. Any other question? No. The organizers as well can ask questions. <laughs> so How, I have one question, sorry. sorry. But in, I mentioned the importance to try to eat organic food, but how we can ensure that this is really organic food with no pesticide or fertilizer? Because I, I was posted in Nepal during several years, and there, there was no real control of what kind of pesticides uh, farmers are using. And they were even poisoning themselves by using this pesticide. Right? How can we ensure that the traceability of the food and the certification of the food? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, because that makes me move to the next part. It's all about certification. We train very well. So this, those, uh, th this temperature <coughs> rate is very important to know for you. And uh, it's very important to understand that cold is not killing the bacteria, but just making them uh, sleep. Let's say that. Sorry, just one question on that. So when you, let's say you eat frozen, when they sleep, do you still get that contamination? Can you eat it safely or not really? As soon as you defrost them and you cook them well, they are yeah. Again. I mean, what I do, I, I buy, for example, fresh bread and I put it in my, frost, uh, my freezer and then I toast it, but there's no risk because, yeah, sorry, I forgot to tell you something very important, it's high risk food and low risk food. When we're talking about high risk food, those are uh, food with high contents of proteins. Mm -hmm. So it's all about dairy products, fish, meat. Yeah. Bread would not be a high risk food. Vegetables are not a high risk food in terms of bacteriological contamination, but not chemical because of the pesticides and phytosanitizers. Yeah, so my question was actually about fruit smoothies. So, which fruits. I normally do smoothies, yes, yeah, so which I normally do half from frozen and half from. It's high, it's low risk food. Low risk. <laughs> but if there is a content in um, sometimes with the milkshakes, that becomes a high risk food. Yeah. But yeah, it's very important to make that distinction. Um, the other thing to consider at home is cross contamination. 
the most important vector of contamination is, do you know what is the most important? Uh, the hands. The hands are the vector of contamination. And this is why we need to clean our hands uh, before preparing food, before um, manipulating raw meats and vegetables, for example, or cleaning the knife, or cleaning the, uh, uh, what is that, the chopping board. The chopping board. Yeah, and uh, never use the same knife to cut tomatoes and raw meat because otherwise uh, the knife would become the vector of contamination. When you go and put your garbage out, you need to clean your hands back. I mean, it's very important to clean the hands. And there was a study in France where they showed that if the kids were cleaning their hands good enough, there would be 40% less absenteeism at school. And during COVID, everybody started to clean their hands very well, but now it's back to normal. <laughs> and my kids said, Mom, do we need to clean our hands more? I said, no, I think it's enough. <laughs> They've been used to always clean their hands. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I cannot eat if my hands are, are you know, sticky and dirty. It's not a good sensation. So it's very important. The other thing is when you go to, to the shop, They are manipulating money and food with the same hands. So that's a, a money is a really high vector of contamination. So it's very important to um, not to be paranoiac. Don't be paranoiac, otherwise you wouldn't eat. But you know, basic uh, rules of hygiene at home, because you're at home. But when it goes to food industry, it's different. Why it's different? Because well, in food industry, we are manipulating volume, and we're talking about big volumes to be export, and the length of time between the production and the consumption is much longer. Whereas at home, it's, you know, it's small scale. It's, you are killing only your family. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> But uh, we've got um, more, I mean, the globalization made the food safety a big issue, a real big issue, especially because of that length that is bigger and we need uh, um, more, I mean, caring more about food safety and this is why we implement food safety management systems. I will speak about organic food as well. So we have a change of uh, behavior, change of trade, change of agricultural practices because in the past we, we would have been sure that uh, we're eating organic food in less developed countries because they didn't have chemicals. But now the problem in a lot of countries, I don't know about Fiji uh, agricultural practices, but if I speak about Morocco where I've grown up, when we were a kid, I was a kid, it was all organic because there was no chemicals. But the problem when they started to import chemicals, the farmers did not know how to use the right dose. And you've got to respect some delay before harvesting. So what I did in some agricultural farm, I put a red light and a green light. Red light would say no harvesting because we, we have to respect the delay before harvesting and green light you could harvest. So for each kind of products, and they don't know, most of the time they don't know how to eat and they don't know how to use uh, the right dose. And um, my last project was in Madagascar. They were importing food from China. It was all written in Chinese. So they cannot respect the dose. So labeling is very important, and this is part of uh, food uh, safety regulation is to ensure that the label is at least in one language of your country. And uh, yeah, the lot of food fraud as well. We could speak about melamine. Melamine was a contamination. It's, it's part of um, uh, processed wood which was found in, in food products. And uh, so it was, uh, I, it was uh, detected in, in Europe. And the problem is that all that food went finished in Africa. Africa is the big garbage of Europe. Anything that is not eaten in Europe is sent to Africa. Uh, the other problem was uh, the medical disease. The problem appears because we gave um, Uh, having an animal, um, animal uh, replacement. replacement, yeah, to eat, but to 
Because they are herbivores, they eat vegetables, and we gave them to eat meat products, and that generates uh, rheumatic disease. Uh, any other big uh, food toxication outbreak that you know? Oh yeah, about temperature, this is what I want to tell you. Do you know why we always buy Coke very fresh? And not necessarily the eggs or the yogurt. How come that people, they buy Coke fresh? Is there a bacteriological risk in terms of temperature? Coke, Coca-Cola. But there's no bacteriological hazard. It's, it's all thanks to the advertising. And this is where the food company has a role to play in communication. It's all about marketing. But no, there's no bacteriological risk. And uh, when you don't drink, I don't drink a lot of Coca-Cola, because first it was a medicine. Uh, and uh, when I got problems of, uh, let's say, bad digestion, I would drink Coke and it would help me because it's a medicine at first. But if you're drinking too much, it won't work. <laughs> so when I drink a Coke, my son tells me, Mom, you're ill. <laughs> because uh, it's like a carbo, because of the carbo, how is that? Carbohydrate. So why is food uh, safety necessary? Because we buy food in the street, because we eat all the time, and we need to ensure that the food that we eat is safe. So those were some pictures that I've taken in the streets, not in Fiji. I will, but not tonight. <laughs> and uh, so it's very important to ensure, for example, um, when I was a kid, we used to buy meat like that, in the butcher. I don't know if it's the case here. Here it's more frozen now than fresh meat, because it's uh, most is imported. But uh, sometimes I prefer to buy fresh meat like that and cook it very well, rather than buying frozen meat with a broken cold chain. But to make sure it's well cooked. And fish as well is a high risk product, so you have to ensure it's fresh. So there are different ways of knowing that the fish is fresh. Do you know how you know that the Look fish? The eyes. the eyes, the color of the skin as well. Uh, the problem with fish now is uh, mainly because of heavy metals, cadmium, lead, that is found in the sea, and plastic contamination. We all eat plastic. So those were pictures taken in Madagascar, I think. And when you prepare food, so it's very important. Um, I remember I was auditing a bakery, and the guy was uh, preparing the pasta. Even though it's a high, a low risk food, he was sweating, you know, on, <laughs> on, on the on the bread pasta. So it gives a, a bit of taste to the bread. <laughs> And now when it comes to fruits and vegetables, there are low risk food, but the problem now is uh, chemical contamination because of the pesticides and phytosanitary products. Um, so the, this is milk leftover. So milk is a very high risk product. It's very important to, uh, I don't know if in Fiji we buy raw milk still. No, it's not allowed. It's not allowed? Okay, because when I was a, a kid, I, my grandparents had a farm, so we were bringing raw milk from the farm, and we were boiling and boiling the milk very long. It's not allowed, but um, I worked in dairy for like one and a half years, and so we had to do by law, it's not allowed, but you have a lot of what they call village cattle. Mm -hmm. So it's not commercial dairy, it's informal uh, dairy. So yes, in uh, the villages, uh, a lot of raw milk is being exchanged, but uh, it shouldn't be the case by law. And what is really important in terms of uh, national industries, and I'm talking to Minister of Health people, 
it's very important not to kill traditional industries. Because if you impose, I will speak about HACCP system a bit later, which is a food safety management system. If you impose that by law to all food industry in the country, you kill your local industries. So it's very important to consider the level of risk. What, what is the uh, market? Um, what is the market? How far is the market? Is it national? Is it regional? Is it international? And um, the food safety management system should be very strict as soon as we export and uh, the distance of consumption is far. So it's very important to have a risk approach. Yes. And this is why I invite you not to be part of the yeah. what you need to What you need to know is that uh, many farms in Fiji do not have water. And if they do, it's only cold water. So they are not going to take out uh, the proteins. They don't have the right detergent to do so. They are only cleaning the the buckets with uh, a bit of cold water. And at times, they don't even have water to do that. So they're just like wiping the, the buckets. Nice to know. <laughs> Thank you. They wipe exactly. Yes. <laughs> Especially when it comes to, uh, I didn't show the procedure for uh, cleaning procedures. It's very important. And most of the people mix up between um, detergent and disinfectants because <coughs> Uh, when we were, you know, using those alcohol thing for our hands, it's a disinfectant, but not a detergent. It's not removing the grease. So when you have cleaning procedures, you've got five steps. First is to rinse the big uh, dirt, and then you put, uh, you have to put detergent, rinse it again, because if you don't rinse it well, the disinfectant won't have the same power of disinfection. So there are very precise steps to do good cleaning. And using alcohol for your hands does not remove the need for washing your hands with the soap. And it's even bad for the, for the body because uh, your skin is part of your body and it's, a, it's an organ as any other. And it's not a closed door for the uh, inside organ. So all the alcohol that you put on your hand will get into your body. So if you give that to kids, you're giving them alcohol. I won't speak about all the preservative and E, uh, 141, tartrazine and all that stuff. But One question, how do you clean your, how do you clean your fruits? I'm curious, of like. I don't use chloride, as my aunt is using chloride because it's a source of it's cancerogen. How, I, how do I clean my fruits? Depends which fruits. The fruits. The fruits. And vegetables you buy and markets. Just water. water. Maybe salads a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I don't. I just put water and I pray. <laughs> <laughs> right. So running the running water rather than putting in a bowl. No, no. I would leave them in in in, in a basin with water, but. No vinegar, no chloride, <laughs> because of the taste. I don't like the taste of vinegar, but I would uh, really rinse them very well. But you know, water, even vinegar, you've got, in Europe, an average 127 products in a salad. So, and it's not hydrosoluble, so even if you clean them with water, it will stay in the cell of the salad. Mm -hmm. So I prefer to be sure about the source, where I buy my food. And when I lived in Morocco, it was great because I implemented some HACCP system in King's Farms. So I was buying from there. And I was sure that it was real organic. That's one part of the question. <laughs> question? Not, not, sorry. Not a question. I just wanted to remind the people following us on Facebook that they can also ask uh, questions if they want. Yes, please. As a follow-up about the ambassador's question about uh, organic food, so that was actually for Kriti, because uh, you mentioned that you were finding as an, the Ministry of Health that uh, many food, uh, food and vegetable vendors would have uh, products that are high in fertilizers. Do you have any publicly available data about that? Uh, right now, Ministry of Health, uh, Ministry of Health does not have any data on that. 
it's Ministry of Agriculture, and uh, till date we are still waiting for information from them. <laughs> so uh, I was attending a forum, I think one month ago, uh, and a staff of Ministry of Agriculture was presenting there. And the staff accidentally revealed that the ministry did a uh, testing a survey on the pesticide level of different foods in Fiji, fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, but they decided to withhold all the, the report. So we, decided, so we just wrote to the Minister of Agriculture directly, uh, asking that he uh, publicly release the report, so the consumers can make informed decisions. So if there's any developments, we'll let everyone know. I will speak about uh, food safety management system and what one very important system is called HACCP system, H-A-C-C-P. So do you know what means HACCP? We don't. On the right meaning is hazard analysis of critical control yes. points. But my meaning is have a nice cup of coffee and pray. <laughs> so, yeah, it's very important to, to make sure about those labels, and I'm going to move to that part. And look, this is the food standards environment. So it, it's very important to understand that we need to ensure quality of food, safety of food, but there are many, many, many labels, many standards, and it's a real pain for the producers. And then you have different kind of audits, and I was qualified in, I'll show you the, the slide. So you've got ISO, ISO is the International Standardization Organization, and they are the one to publish international standards. So in terms of food, the main standard is ISO 22,000 standards, then you've got HAZAP, I'll come back to HAZAP, you've got BS, BRC, you've got GMP plus, you've got AB plus, it's agriculture biologic, it's for organic food in French, GMO free, global gap, fair trade, FSSC 22,000, and many, 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 many more, Halal, uh, IFS, so there are many, many labels. And it's a problem. Why it's a problem? Because first, we need to ensure the uh, credibility of the label. And for that, there are some procedures for auditing. The auditors need to be well qualified, well trained, and well experienced, just like a pilot. I was qualified as uh, an auditor, and I've trained more than 1,000 of auditors in ISO 22000, DRC, IFS, HACCP, Global Gap. And I just stopped because every time you have to qualify, you have to pay. So it's for me a technical barrier to trade. And it's very important to understand which label you want considering your market. Because if you, um, if you are a big company and you're exporting, ISO 22000 is very well done in Europe, but not, not in the US. Uh, the US they would ask for HACCP certification, but HACCP cannot be a certificate because it's a codex alimentarius, so it's part of the WHO standards. It's, a, it's not a regulation, it's a, it's a standard. It should not be certified. Some countries impose HACCP in their legislation when it comes to high-risk food, dairy products, milk products, meat, fish, for export. If you impose HACCP to your local producers, as I told you, you're going to kill your national activity. So, um, depending where you are in the, in the process chain, uh, you see ISO 22000 would, uh, would it could, it's really from farm to fork, what we call farm to fork. It's really from the first point of production to the end point of consumption. Farm to fork, that's an expression in our, in our business. ISO 9001 is about quality management system, 14,000 is environmental, and 45 is the safety of the worker, but the food safety is really 22,000. Global gap is mainly for agricultural side, and you've got different standards for global gap. And then you've got um, IFS, 
Um, we've got IFS food, IFS logistics is for the supply chain. It's a, it's a European standard, a, a private standard that is requested by main supermarket, main retailers. So the retailers are making, uh, they've got the power of buying. So they are the ones to impose such or such standard. And if you want, and for example, if you want to export tomatoes to Europe, you need to be IFS, BRC, Global Gas, you need all those standards. It costs a lot of money, it needs a lot of investment as well, because if you want to obtain those certificates, you have to upgrade your equipment and to ensure the traceability of the food. There are many uh, things to ensure. BRC is more for the UK market. And you've got FSSC 20,000 is taking over ISO 22,000, so ISO have done a a partnership with GFSI, which is the Global Food System Initiative, I think. And um, the, I think it's the most recognized label in food safety, but it's very, very complex for small producers. I will tell you what are the um, requirements for that, just very quickly, but you see it's, for example, for a restaurant, it's no need to be ISO 22000, but being a, HACCP to follow HACCP principles, it's very good. So um, it's very important when you go to advise food producers to consider, to make a risk assessment. What kind of food they're producing? Is it high risk or low risk food? What is their market? Is it proximate or is it export? Um, how big is the, um, is the company? Okay. And when it goes to organic food, um, real organic is very difficult because you're considering the environment and there are different uh, organic labels. Here in Fiji, you've got Organic Pacifica. <coughs> Sorry. And it's important to ensure the way uh, they audit the system. <coughs> Sorry. So it's important to ensure that the, uh, the audit is well done with qualified auditors. So it's not only the label, but really what is behind the label, how it is done. And when I was in Morocco, I was the managing uh, director of a certification body, which is AFNOR, which is a French certification body. And we would have audits from COFRAC, which is the French accreditation body. So when, let's go back. So you've got a certification body which would deliver the label and that certification body should be accredited by an accreditation body. The problem in the region is that accreditation bodies are in uh, New Zealand and Australia so they need to call just ants or other accreditation bodies and certification bodies so they've got auditors so those auditors must be well trained and qualified for the standards so if you consider one organic standard they should be trained to that standard if you consider a hazard they should be trained to the specific standard and then you've got the audit process And for that, there is an international standard which is called ISO 1911. And you have to follow some specific steps of certification. And the problem is that certification is a business. So that the people buy the label. I had some clients coming to my office saying, oh, can you put uh, your stamp ISO 9000 there because I've got a public tender. I said, no, it doesn't work that way. You need to be audited, you need to um, and each certification cycle is a three-year cycle, and every year you have a follow-up audit. And this is what we're trying to do in that project with the forum, is really to ensure that there is a regional quality infrastructure, and by uh, next month, in November, we should launch the regional quality policy, because some countries, they are too small to have their own national standardization body, so there's one in Fiji, which is part of ISO, 
And uh, two weeks ago, we were at ISO annual meeting in Brisbane to see how the region can uh, have a regional approach and share competencies and qualification of people in terms of auditors, testing, uh, laboratories, metrology, and this is all about the quality infrastructure. So it's very important you as public and consumer association to create awareness for the uh, local producers not to buy a label like that. Yes. Awareness is very important. It's very important to understand the process. Uh, I've met the people of Organic Pacifica, and they are doing a good job at SPC. They've got qualified auditors. So you have to make sure when you buy a, a certificate, a label, what is behind. And you can check on the website. Because some certification bodies, they need to have the accreditation is linked to the scope, which standard, and which geographical area. And some certification bodies are not credible. I had some clients asking me to audit their suppliers that were certified to check it was credible, it was, the system was really there. Because as long as it's very important to have labels, but you have to be aware of what's behind. Just like when you buy a car, or a telephone, or any product. What are you buying the brand? What's behind the brand? When you want to check the uh, technical uh, specification of the product. Now, uh, there is organic farming, which is very difficult because you have to consider the environment. And there is sustainable farming, which is a bit less strict than organic farming. And for me, I'm more to buy approximate food rather than imported organic food, for example. Because tell me how it is organic when it has been traveling 20 hours. It's not, I mean, it's not logical. So it's very important to know where the product comes from and uh, what is behind the label. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but to, to have a sensible approach. I don't know if I answered your question. But it's, I mean, organic for me is not a proof of, uh, of, uh, of quality. It depends which brand. I cannot put all organic in one basket. It depends really which brand. So if you look at the supply chain, so from the farm, then you've got the, the industry transformation, transport and distribution. So what is really important is to have a systemic approach. And this is where uh, traceability comes in, because you have to consider uh, not only safety um, requirements within the process industry, but in between, during the supply chain, within the transport, how is it transport? Are the, is the cleaning uh, conditions are good? The temperature conditions? All the supply chain is really important and you've got information flow. So what we're testing as well as, uh, in terms of traceability, if there is a problem with the product, we would be, we, the company should be capable of uh, retracting the product from the market or to give a specific code to say this product is not good. <coughs> Just like when there's a problem with uh, cars, they give you a specific number, serial number of the car, it should be the same with the food. <coughs> All right. So we've got regulatory bodies, so Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Ministry of Industry, and standardization bodies. So here, what we call NSDs are national standardization bodies. In Fiji, it's the DNMTS, and it's uh, launched at the Ministry of Industry. In Australia, it's Standards Australia. Uh, each country has got their accreditation bodies or certification bodies. So we have to ensure as well the supply chain, so you need to know from where you buy. I don't know how you ensure the, the supply of the restaurant, but I think it's a big challenge. 
and the general society, the people, they should know, they should be aware. I think education is very important so that the people, they know what they eat. I mean, they are really caring about their portable phone, but not what they are putting into their body. So it's very important to create awareness. And uh, yeah, the bank and insurance can play a role as well because some some banks give uh, loans to help the companies to develop their certification, their training, and it's in t terms of capability, capacity building. And uh, this is the whole uh, food safety uh, supply chain uh, for the ISO 22000, but I wanted just not to stay too long. So the key principle of ISO 22000 you see, we have HACCP plan. That's the basic of the ISO 22000. But then you need to have a traceability system, which is very important. Supply chain management with interactive communication with what happened before with the raw materials and what will happen after at the retail stage. A systemic approach, the so PDCA. PDCA means plan to check act, so it's an improvement loop. or it or it could mean please don't change anything, depends. <laughs> and PRP or prerequisite program. So you see here it's quite complex. This system is good for food factories that are exporting a larger volume, like a company like um, Pure Fiji, for example, or I mean that kind of company that are organized, they can, they can put that, but not the small producers. So the PRPs, the GMPs are good manufacturing practices, and those are the basic, good hygienic practices, good agricultural practices. It's all about uh, the basic hygienic practices, then you've got the HACCP system, and then you've got the management system. So at least if we could have the first step for the local producers training people on good hygienic practices, that would be very good including in the marketplace, especially for meat and fish. And to conclude and to open to a next step, it would be about new marketing. And uh, I mean, we're all programmed to buy food, to eat food, considering, uh, I just passed that very quickly because it's time finished, I just we consider the perception, so we consider the five senses. We choose the food according to our five senses. Our memory is our cultural taste. Our evaluation, what is good, what, what is not good. Our attention to, to which element I will put my attention to. And action will be the decision-making process. And the, the uh, marketer, they know very well that. And they know how to make you buy the food they want because there are a lot of principles that are used in retailers, uh, in the supermarket, but as well in, in a bakery, for example, in France, some bakery, they are putting more um, flavor of the bread, the cooked bread, which is illegal if you don't produce your bread, but then it would increase the uh, turnover of 40% of the bakery. Uh, McDonald's are using a lot of that as well. I won't say too much. I keep it for next time. Uh, but in supermarket, there is a flow. The way you go and do your shopping, everything has been calculated. They know everything about you. And they know how to make you buy food. And to rebuy food. And to get addicted, because the first addiction is sugar. And they're adding a lot of sugar in any food, like bread, um, McDonald's, ketchup, all those processed food and uh, junk food. And it's, it's very important to be aware of what you're putting in your body. So good appetite. I'm just on time, but I'm ready for any questions. We have a question on uh, Facebook from uh, Lanietta. So perhaps you can speak on the, on the French side. Um, are there any awareness programs for local schools? And then we can ask uh, the people here present for teaching schools. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's part of the, of the project is to develop some e-learning modules 
both for industries but for general public as well. But it would be really great to work with the Ministry of Education and to introduce such uh, courses and awareness sessions for the schools. Merci. Merci d'avoir été là. Parfait, merci. So in Fiji we have uh, health promoting schools uh, and uh, one of the components is the uh, WASH program. So it focused around uh, hand washing and having access to clean and safe products. That's one component. And then the other side of it is the nutrition. So uh, we do have uh, something around eating healthy, nutritious, uh, but not so much on the organic side of it, like growing food. But the, uh, from our health side, we try to teach, uh, when we do awareness in school, especially when it comes to uh, cap sweeping, where parents and uh, teachers with the uh, uh, Ministry of Health, we try to teach more on uh, reading labels, food labels. We do have some IC materials surrounding that, and then we do have some trainings surrounding growing your own food, uh, especially when we talk about pesticides and all these things. Uh, in Fiji, so we have uh, our own trainings, we train communities, we try to teach uh, teachers, and this is surrounding the growing their own food. And what is, what is really important, uh, I think I, I've put here a push strategy is really when the uh, public organization, the ministries, the public association are pushing and giving information and protecting the consumer. But then we need to develop a pool strategy by educating the people because you cannot have enough enforcement officers to control everything. So the people need to know what they are eating. And the food industry have a major role to play in education through advertisement. It's very important. My question is about the labels. Uh, someone who's worked in this industry, and uh, I understand from what you tell us today that even some certification bodies cannot be trusted. So, how can you tell a label that can be trusted from another? And as a customer, is it worth uh, relying on the labels in our choices, or is it something we should be uh, keep we're questioning? Talking, we're talking about quality labels, but not the food labeling. Quality label, if you are curious. You just type on your Google and see <coughs> how they are organized. And uh, you can, as a consumer, you can ask questions. And I think just by visiting their website, you would have a better idea of the way they are um, organized. Um, I'm not saying that we should not trust them, but we should be aware rather than not trusting them. But uh, not only the consumer, but the especially the food industry that are buying that system, they need to ensure it's the right label considering their market, considering their kind of products, and what is their objective, because it costs a lot of money, it's an investment, it should not be an expense, but it helps to better organize the overall company. Um, I mean, I'm for implementation of quality management system, it's very good, but it has to be a return on investment improving the overall system. You know, it's just like MBAs. You can buy an MBA on what internet to do. So I have a question on insects in dry food. So for example, uh, whenever I buy uh, lentils, legumes, and uh, for example, rice, um, especially some of the local brands are quite systematic that I open the packet and there's insects in there. And especially in summer, it can happen all the time. So how, how serious is that? I mean, I find it obviously not very pleasant. <laughs> Most of the times I may have to throw it away. 
uh, but how serious it is to if something that has, I don't know, maybe just a few insects that you wash away and you, <laughs> you know, it, it's a huge problem here. So I really wanted to know how it can be really a problem or how it's just not great. And as you said, it's dry food and we have a big problem here at the humidity. Yeah. Humidity is a very, uh, because when you, you store dry food, humidity must be less than I forgot, but it has to be very low, which is not the case here. So uh, I mean, I wouldn't throw away the rice because I find one insect. But of course, if there are many, I would throw it away. It's a question of good sense, and uh, because the insects are contamination, but there are experiments as well. And you know, the, the flies when they are flying, they are contaminated all over the place and usually the the food for the flight are faces from animals. So when you put the fly on your salad, it comes from eating faces of the dog or it's <laughs> nice before an aperitif huh? <laughs> I'm sorry. I always feel sorry, but you know when I did, I used to do uh, food safety uh, trainings since uh, more than 30 years and I always use videos because the problem we don't see bacteria. People don't see it, so they don't understand the cleaning and the way they should clean. They've always done it the same way. They are doing everything not to wash their hands. They are very creative in squeezing the washing hands uh, facilities. But then when you show them what it is in videos, in images, they understand. Everybody understands. And they don't need to know how to read or write, but just by pictures and showing the consequences. I think people are not aware of the, the hazard level. And I didn't speak a lot about chemical contamination, but it's really, really bad because we eat every day and if you eat small dose of chemicals every day, it means long, long-term illness such as cancers. And uh, we know that allergies and cancers have increased in our society because of the industrialization of food, food processing. So try to eat fresh. Try to have your uh, kitchen garden as well. This is what I'm doing as well. I have my tomatoes and my basil and my salads. In France, not here yet, <laughs> maybe. But try to really uh, eat fresh and to uh, have pleasure at eating food. And don't, I mean, don't bother of all those things. Those are more for food industries, otherwise you wouldn't eat anymore. But maybe we can have a, a drink. I'm sorry for the people on Facebook Live who won't have nice red wine or any nice drink, but uh, we will think of you. Thank you for being there. <laughs> and please ask your questions on the comments. I will try to answer. And we can continue uh, asking questions around the drink if you want. Just a comment on Facebook says, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much.